so I can preach. Thursday night, we, my men's group, we, we did a study on praise and worship. Amen. How the Bible just says so much about worshiping the Lord and being in His presence. And how, what He thinks about it. Just amazing. Yeah. And in the book of Zechariah, I'm trying to think what verse it was, but it was amazing because we find out that God sings. Did you know that? Yeah. Yes. God Himself sings. And guess what He's singing about? He's rejoicing over us. Yeah. How's that? Yeah. Never thought that, huh? Yeah. Yes. He rejoices over His people. Hallelujah. I like that. I like a God who is singing over me. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Glory. Man. Wish you could stay in His presence all yeah. week, huh? Like this. Yeah. You wouldn't care what the world's doing. You wouldn't care what problems you're facing. You wouldn't care about anything. Hallelujah. So, we're going to continue in our series on evangelism. Last week, we asked the question, who cares if sinners go to hell? We found out that God the Father cares. God the Son cares. God the Holy Spirit cares. All of heaven cares. All of hell cares, and we care. If you're really a child of God and belong to His church, then we care if sinners go to hell. And I don't believe there's anybody here that, that if you really understood the horrors of hell and the place called hell, would wish anybody to go there. Even your, your staunch enemy, you wouldn't want to see them go because you know the horror that, that is involved in that. So really, to be successful in anything in life, we're going to have to be motivated. And motivation is something that gives us the drive to reach our goal. We have a goal. In fact, the Apostle Paul said, I fought the good fight. <laughs> I ran the race. I reached my goal. See, all through Paul's life, he had a goal. To reach. And he said that goal was to receive a crown from the Lord. And he told the church, he said that that crown is not just for me. But the crown is for you too. See, we all going to get one. If we're motivated to make it to the end. I decided 46 years ago I'm going to make it to the end. And, and my commitment is getting stronger every day that I live. Because yes. I'm getting closer to getting there. I see the finish line. Hallelujah. But churches, you know, have tried all kinds of... And I've been in church long enough. Been pastoring, going on 36 years. We tried everything. <laughs> tried all kind of gimmicks, all kind of things. We had the power team. We had, we had Heaven's Gates... Uh, 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 heaven's gates, hell's flames. We put on productions. We put on all kind of stuff to try to reach people for Christ. But you know, earthly means is not what the church needs. Right. And those kind of things. And I got people calling me all the time. Let's come put. No, I don't, I don't want. It. I did all that. Done that. Been there. Done that. And I didn't like the results. But it's all kind of things the church is trying to do to reach people for Christ. But you see, the church's motivation has got to come from heaven. Not from earth. Come on. See, because what the church has to do is the plan of heaven. It's not anything from earth. So if we want to reach people for Christ, then we need to get heavenly means. We need to get Supernatural means, not just earthly strategies. We tried all kinds of things. And, and I didn't like the results of it, and I realized that what we need is just to be touched from heaven, get the heart of God, get a burden for the lost like God has and sent His Son to the cross of Calvary. 
if we can see that, then that's really what the church really needs. Because anyone who has a burden for the lost, his motivation comes from God. I want to tell you that. It don't come from me. I can preach the gospel, but it doesn't come from me. It's got to come from God. Get the get cold in here, those people. We want to get cold. We want to get hot. Come on. The Apostle Paul reveals some heavenly motivations that he had to do what he did. You know, the Apostle Paul probably did more work than anybody. In fact, he even says that, not bragging. He said, just by the grace of God, I've worked harder, started more churches than any of the super apostles. In other words, all the, the 12. I, I did more work than all of them. But it's not because of me. It's because of the grace of God that's on me. And Paul started all the churches. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. And But Paul tells us that it was all heavenly motivations. It was things from God that caused him to do the things that he did. And he was very successful. And if we're going to be successful, we need to look at the motivations that motivated the greatest apostle ever lived to do what he did. And if we look at this church, if we're going to do what we need to do here, listen, this is going to be a miracle. It's a miracle now, but you're going to see something happen if we are motivated by the same things that motivated the Apostle Paul. You believe that? Come on, you believe the same yeah. things that worked yeah. for him yeah. will work Come for on. us? I think so. Come on. Come on. I know so. Yeah. So Paul started many churches because Paul witnessed everywhere he went. He taught the Word of God everywhere he went. And whatever church would let him in, he preached the gospel. And most of the churches that, that we read about in the New Testament, Paul started. He would go into the city, start witnessing. Then he would go into the Jewish synagogues. Some of them didn't like what he had to say. Kicked him out. Ran him out. But he'd go to the Gentiles that didn't know anything about God. Just like these people out in the world here that you work with. That's in your name. We don't know nothing about God. We do. We got to tell them. You got to tell them about God. They don't know anything about it. So what happened, Paul had a call to preach the gospel. He was against the church, like many religious people, against the church, the real church. There's a fake church out there. Right. Come on. Come Just like our president said, there's fake news out there. There's a fake church out there. Come on. That's actually against the real church. Right. The spirit-filled church. The one who is motivated by the power and the anointing of God. They don't like that. We don't want that. We don't want God here. We just want people here. Right. In fact, I had, uh, I had somebody in my family go to church. I'm not going to mention your name. But they said they asked the leaders there why they, they allowed the Holy Spirit to move in the place. Why there's no gifts of the Spirit operating? Why, why, they, why they don't let the Spirit of God move in there? And they said, don't you see all these people we have here? They might leave. Hmm. Listen, Lord help us if that's the way we look at things. But Acts chapter 9, verse 22, this is what happened to Paul. Paul was against the church, but he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And it says in verse 22, yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. You've got to understand, there was no New Testament written. I'm preaching from the New Testament. I'm preaching from the Old too. But I had the New Testament, the Revelation. Paul had to use the Old Testament scriptures to prove to the Jews that Jesus of Nazareth, who died on the cross of Calvary, was the Christ. And he did it. The Bible says he became more and more powerful in what he was preaching. So I really entitled this message 
compelling forces. See, Paul had compelling forces that, that, that he reveals in the Word of God that was not from earth, they were from heaven. This is the things that, that, that must compel this church if we're going to do the things God called us to do. Paul had compelling forces. And I want to look at these compelling forces because really, they really need to compel us to do what God has called this group to do. Say, well, there ain't many of us. I don't care. Jesus had 12, and they, 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 they reached the whole world. I don't, I don't worry about that. In fact, the Bible says, with God, few is okay. Gideon started with 30,000 warriors. God, you got too many people here. Came down to 300. <laughs> and he won the battle and he needed the battle. But to, to be a witness of Jesus Christ in the world, we got to be, be compelled to do that. Webster defines the word compel like this. It says to drive or urge forcefully or irresistibly. In other words, a force you can't resist. So you're compelled to do it. And to cause or to do or occur by overwhelming pressure. That's what we need. We need some overwhelming pressure in the Holy Ghost. That, that, that you can't not do it. You have to do it. You know, you have to do it. And then it says to drive together. It's like the church if we're compelled. We're going we're gonna to drive together. The Holy Ghost is going to lead us off. We're going to all go together. We're going to move together. Same direction, same place, same purpose. Yeah. But the first compelling force I found that Paul had, he was compelled by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> this is why I'm saying we got to be open to the Holy Ghost. we got to believe that God's presence is here. we got to believe that He leads us, He guides us, He corrects us, He convicts us, He does, He reveals to us. we got to believe that the Holy Spirit is here. Acts chapter 20, verse 22, Paul says, And now compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. This is all the Holy Spirit's telling him, compelling him to move on. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Paul said, I was compelled to do it. I was compelled to go to Jerusalem. Guess what? If you read this whole text here, he's talking to the church in Ephesus, and they're trying to tell him not to go. He said, they're going to kill you when you get there. He said, what do I care about? The Holy Spirit's telling me to go. Come on. Whatever I face, I'm going to face. But I am compelled to go. The Apostle Paul was speaking to the elders of the church. They loved Paul. Paul started that church. And they told him, don't go. We love you. Don't go. He's telling them he is compelled by the Holy Ghost. In other words, I've got orders from heaven. I gotta do this thing. Come on. You see, I gotta do this thing. Yes. Gotta obey. Come on. Listen, I've done things as a pastor. When I first took this church over, this church was in a different authority system. They had board members and all of that kind of stuff that that somehow uh, I had to answer to. I guess they thought I did, but I knew I didn't have to answer to them. I answered to God. Yeah. That's right. When God directed me to go into small groups to start evangelizing. They didn't like it because it was going to mess up the structure that they had there. I said, no, we ain't going for this, Pastor. So you might not be going for it. I'm going for it. Because I heard from God. What does the Bible say? Who are we going to obey? God or man? I think I'm going to obey God. Yeah, he rules. But but he said his life was not worth anything to him but to do what God's telling us to do. This church is not worth anything 
unless we follow God, unless we do what God is leading this group to do, we're not worth anything. See, and, 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 and he had to complete the task, and that task of testifying of the gospel of God's grace, he was being driven by the compelling force of the Holy Spirit. Listen, we, we got to be so in tune with the Holy Spirit that he moves us. See, it's got to be that same compelling force that should be driving this church, driving us as believers. The Holy Spirit was compelling force behind all of Paul's work. If you, there was a time where Paul wanted to go to a certain place and, and he was telling uh, uh, his, the, the church, I wanted to go over here. But the Holy Spirit said, no, you can't go over there. You got to go over here. He says, I, I, was, I was stopped. I could not go any further. The Holy Spirit, he was going in a direction he thought was good to go preach the gospel. Holy Spirit said, don't do it. And guess what? Sometimes the Holy Spirit tells you no. Right. The right, Holy right. Spirit will always say yeah. yeah. He okay. says no. That's right. That's right. The Lord spoke to the prophet Ezekiel about this compelling force that would come. God revealed the new covenant to the prophet Ezekiel in chapter 36, verse 26. He says, I will give you a new heart. Put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Yeah. Come on, How's that? Come on, he said, I'm going to put my spirit in you. Yes. And that spirit in you is going to move you to follow what I want you to do. Now, the, the Holy Spirit, the NIV says the Holy Spirit will move you to follow. I like the King James Version. It says my Spirit will cause you yeah. to follow me. It will cause you to do what I'm telling you to do. In other words, you're not going to have any choice about it. Listen, there was things God told me. I didn't have a choice about it. Listen, when God tells you something, if you think you're big enough to not do it, That's not going to be me. It will cause you or compel you or motivate you to do what he wants you to do. The Holy Spirit will be a compelling force behind you to witness that's his mission on earth. Jesus said, I'm going away, but I'm going to send you another comforter. He's going to be with you. What is he going to do? He's going to convict the world of sin. He's going to reveal the truth. And he's going to cause you to go out there. This is what Jesus said would come. He says in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and in Metairie and Kenner and West Wego and Harvey and Baton Rouge, wherever, East Bank, West Bank, whatever bank, it, wherever we are, he is going to cause us by the Holy Spirit to be a witness to whoever's there. Yeah. I care who's there. Mm -hmm. See, and there are many attributes to having the Holy Spirit. Being a witness to, to people is what Jesus said is the main priority. You know, people want to get filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to get filled. I want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I want to speak in tongues. I want to prophesy. I want to do all this. I want to lay hands on the sick. All oh, that's fine. But the main reason you get the Holy Spirit is to be a witness. That's the greatest thing. Not that you speak in tongues, but that you're a witness. Not only to speak for the Lord, but the Holy Spirit is going to allow you to live for the Lord. If you're not living for the Lord, don't even open your mouth. If you're living for the Lord, then you can be a witness to the Lord. And the Holy Spirit will allow you to do two things. To live for Him and to witness 
for the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the first thing that will motivate you is being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's why we, we're Holy Ghost people. We're not ashamed of it. That's right. We're not ashamed of it. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I speak in tongues, prophesy, whatever. Whatever God wants me to do. I got His Spirit in me. I want to be led. I want to be motivated. I want Him to cause me to do what He wants yeah. me to yeah. do. Thank the you, second thing, the motivation, is that Paul was compelled by the fear of the Lord. Come on. Yeah, that's good. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. He said, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade men. What we are is plain to God. And I hope it's also plain to your conscience. The fear of the Lord is a compelling factor. Now, this fear is not terror. Come on. It's not right. terror. That's right. See, we, the, the terror of God has been removed by the cross of Calvary. Right. See, we don't fear God anymore because God has washed all of our sins away. We don't fear God for hell. We're not going to hell. What we got to fear God for is that God knows what he did for you, how he changed your life. And how, because he put his spirit in you, how you should be living and how you need to be moved by the Holy Spirit and obey God, that's what you're going to be judged for. Come on. That's Think good. about it. Remember that dream I told you I had last week that just, just almost destroyed me? Just think about being here at this judgment. See, there's two judgment seats. There's the judgment seat of Christ where the believers are going to be judged. You're not going to be judged for your sin. Right. You're going to be judged for what you did or you didn't do Come on. for God. Right. The, yes. the other guys at the, at, the, at the white throne judgment, that's where the sinners are going to be. Guess what? They have no shot. They're going straight into the lake of fire. Right. Us, we're going to have to answer to God after we know the truth. What did we do with it? That's right. Right. Come on. Preach. Come on. What do we do with it? Yeah. Come on. How did I act? How many people I passed by that I could have witnessed to and I did? And the Holy Spirit was telling you, go over there and witness it. No, I'm too busy. Mm -hmm. No, they might not like me. Oh, no. No. Where believers are going to be judged for the things done in the body, good or bad, after we've come to the truth. What Paul was saying, that this Christian life is no joke. No, right. This ain't a joke here. This is serious. This is life and death. Yes, it is. To everyone. This life and death is no joke. It's, it's serious. Paul knew that there would be such a thing as a Christian being. There's no such thing. You know, people say, well, I got saved, man. I was just keeping it to myself. No, you can't. You can't be an innocent bystander and let people that you could have talked to get by. You can't say, well, I'm innocent. I just don't feel like God. No, you're going to be judged for that. The Holy Spirit is going to lead us to people. We can't stand around, watch people go to hell, don't say anything, when the Holy Spirit is anointing us to say something. Yeah. Come on. Yes, Jesus. You know, it has been said that if sinners could get one glimpse of hell, they would repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why hell and brim, brimstone preaching used to be an order. People used to preach on hell. Hell, you go to hell. You go to hell. You go to hell. You go to hell. <laughs> what, what a sinner. What a sinner to see hell. But guess what? I think if a believer got one glimpse of hell, he would.
to go out and tell everybody. Come on. Don't worry about the sinner seeing hell. We need to see it. Because if we see it, then we're going to look at our family and our friends. Man, if they don't come to Christ, they go in that place. God showed me what it's like. Well, we just heard a voice from there last week, didn't we? The rich man was down there. And he was telling Abraham, send somebody back for my brothers. Right. Because I know they're living just like I'm living. They don't want them right here. Right. Right. If they don't believe in Lord Jesus Christ, they go, they're going there. Yes. See, I think we would pray for opportunities to witness to somebody. We would pray. We would have compassion and reach out to them. See, I know for a fact the Word of God tells me I'm going to be responsible for what I'm preaching here. You, think, you don't think so? Read the Scripture. In fact, I'm going to be, I'm going to be judged more harshly than anybody. Right, that's right. That's right. Because I know it, and I've been called to do it. See, I'm going to stand and say, you know, that's why I'm not preaching them them feel good messages. I don't want. I don't want to be in that line. Yes, right. Right. Come on, I don't want to be in that line. Thank you, I'm going to be held accountable for preaching the gospel. But guess what? You're going to be held accountable too for just witnessing the people. Paul said every Christian has been given this responsibility to do it. Look what he says, telling the church in Corinth. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. He said, all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We therefore, Christ's ambassadors, as though God was making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. What, what, what Paul was telling the church, we all, you don't have to be a minister, That's right. you are a minister of reconciliation. Right. Every one of us, who hold the keys to heaven yes. can go tell somebody yes. you can get in. Yeah, come on, Jesus. You can get in. Yes. I, I know how to get in. Mm -hmm. I got the key. His name is Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yeah. You can get in. I, I have the key. I can be a minister of reconciliation. I can bring that. Well, what, what does Peter say? We've been, we're, we're all priesthood. Every one of us. Yep. I can mediate. I can get somebody who's lost and bring them to the cross of Calvary. Come on. To where they get in. Come on. In fact, Paul calls us Christ ambassadors. You know what an ambassador is? Ambassador is someone who represents a country. And when he goes over into another country, he has the authority from the country that sent him. Guess what? There's two kingdoms here. There's a kingdom of Satan, kingdom of the darkness, and there's the kingdom of God who is the king of kings and lord of lords, has all authority over everything. So when he sends us out as an ambassador, you're not speaking for world prayer tabernacle. Right. When you go out there, you're speaking... <laughs> From the country that you have your citizenship in. Yeah. And that's the kingdom of God. You've been sent by the king. Yes. Thank you, Lord. You've been sent by the king. Yeah. You see, the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. And Paul said, while we're saying it, it's as if God is making his appeal through us to that person. Guess what? God loves that person more than you do. Right. He's just using you. But as you're speaking to that person, 
It's God who is making the appeal, not you. You might say, well, I love this person. I really want to see him say, God loves him more. Yeah. Right. Say, no, I've I, I got to get to that person because I really love the person. I want to say, God, God loves them more. Mm -hmm. So when you're reaching to them, it's God by his Holy Spirit who is making the appeal. God is giving you the words and it's, it's going to happen if they receive it. You know, especially when it's a divine appointment with somebody. Yeah. Yeah. How many believe in that? Come on. Come on. Sometimes right. you will run into somebody. Yes, it's a divine appointment. Yes, and I'm going to tell you something. You've got to recognize that because that's time for you to say, Holy Ghost, give me the words. Yeah. <laughs> this ain't no accident here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, had to, you had to bring this thing together. Right. And you got to give me the words. God will give you the words. Out of the blue, God put somebody in your path. I told you the story last week about John DeSalvo, who was in my school at the time. It was his divine appointment. I prayed about it. He said, God said, there he is right there. You see, you know it. it's a divine appointment because they're receptive to hear it. I think I told y'all a story when I when I had my beauty schools. I had a private shop that I worked on the weekends after I was teaching. The last client in my chair was a a, a backslidden sister from the church. She was backslidden. She happened to be my last one. I said, "This is going to be good. I'm going to do a hair, and I'm going to minister to her." Yes. I just happened to have a little. Cajun lady from Napoleonville that wanted to come and shampoo and watch me cut hair. And she was sitting, just so the shop was finished, just me, the client, and her. She was sitting right on side. I'm doing her hair, and I'm, I'm telling her, Sissy, you need to repent. You need to get back in there. God loves you. God did so much for you. I'm just laying it on her, you hear? This little Catholic lady sitting there, hearing me. And before that sister left, I said, we're going to pray. I said, I'm going to pray for you. Here she's in my chair. I'm praying for her. I'm not a minister. I'm a believer. Yes. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. I'm praying for her. You need to get back in. God's going to forgive you. God's going to restore you. Okay. So after she paid me, she left. It's me and the, the little Cajun lady. She says, I have never heard anybody talk like you talk. I said, what on? <laughs> I said, I'm a spirit-filled Christian. That's yeah. what I am. This is what we do. Yeah. She said, what church you go to? I, it was the Assembly of what? It was the Lakeview Christian Center. I said, it's Assembly of God Church. She went back home. She went to Assembly of God Church in Napoleonville, got saved, Come called on. me up. Come on, Jesus. I'm with you, she said. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know what that reminded me of? It reminded me of the woman in the Bible who went to Jesus. She had a demon-possessed daughter at home. She wasn't a Jew. She was a Gentile. She was begging Jesus, begging Jesus. And the apostles tried to get her to go away. And she came up and she said, she started telling Jesus about her daughter with the demon. And Jesus said, look, I can't give the, the children's bread to dogs. The woman said, I know that. All I want is the crumbs off the table. Yeah. 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 This woman, I wasn't even talking to her. Come on. I was ministering. To the sister, the backslidden sister in the chair, and the crumbs were falling off the table. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Yes. Mm. Yes, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> you think this stuff's that powerful? Ooh. Come on. Huh? Yes. You think it's that powerful? The crumbs will get them saved. Yes. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Come on. And when you're doing that, when you have a divine appointment like that, I want to tell you something. You're right in the presence of God. I don't care where you're at. 
You'd be at a bus stop. Right. You're right in the presence of God. Because mm -hmm. God is using you. Even if they spit in your face after. That's right. You can laugh and say, God, man, God used me to do that. He spit my mouth and can't. Because you're standing here representing the throne of God. Yes. You represent, you're the ambassador to watch it up there. Mm -hmm. You're the ambassador of Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Let me tell you another story. About 15 years ago, it's when I was pastoring the, the Chalmette campus. I heard that a friend that me and Sister Dorn grew up with died. Guy in the neighborhood, drag race together. We did all kinds of things together. Just a neighborhood guy, been knowing him all my life. He died. And the funeral was right over here on Veterans Highway. We had things to like, like Seag and whatever that place is. And, and I told Sister Dawn, I said, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to the office right now. I'm going to go to the funeral. I said, because you know who's going to be there? I said, all the friends that we grew up with, all the people that knew him that Paul and Bob were going to be there. I said, I'm going to go there. Yes. And, and then I'm going to go to the office at the church. And, and while I was going there, I was praying. I said, Lord, just, just give me an opportunity. I know all my old friends are going to be there. We're going to be there talking about old times. And we're going to be doing all this stuff. And, and I said, just give me one, one person. One of them. Just give me one. And in this series, I think I'm going I'm to talk about the value of one. Yeah. Come on. Can I say, Lord, just let the conversation, they all know I'm a minister. Let, let, let the conversation go where just one of them I can talk to. And sure enough, I walk in, and in the foyer of the funeral home, there's all my guys. I jump right in the middle of them. We're all talking about old times and all we used to do and all those things we used to do. It's just having a great time. All of a sudden, the brother of the, the, the man that died, his older brother, comes right in the middle of us. He looks at me. He says, Carl, aren't you a minister? I said, yes, I am. He says, you want to say something? I said, what do you want me to say? He said, whatever you do. I said, hold on one minute. Come on. Come on. I went out in my, in my car. I got this. I had to go find a room. I had to go find a room. Give me a room. I need, I need, I need to prepare this thing. It was a Catholic thing. I got up first. The Catholic priest was sitting in a chair right over here. I'm up first. <laughs> Guess what? I'm looking out over there. It's everybody I grew up with. Everybody. All of them. I can name them all to you. Boom! The gospel. I started giving the gospel. I mean, I was giving them everything I could, God was giving me. I was just laying it out there, man. I was just pouring it out there. I told him, I witness to this guy here. He didn't listen. I witnessed to him. He didn't listen. And I, I, just, I just went on and on. I just preached the whole thing. Okay, when I got through, the older brother told the priest, he says, Father, do you want to say anything? The priest sat there and he went, so when it was over one of the guys came up to me he says you know something Carl he says you'd make a good salesman I said I know it because you see I'm peddling the best product it's easy when you got the best product it's easy to sell. He laughed at me. But think about that. All I was doing was praying for the Lord to let me just speak to one. I wind up speaking to every one of them. Right. Come on. Come on. Put that down. We got to be ready. 
Paul said, that we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade men. Yes. See, once you know that we've got to persuade people, we ain't got to go beat them over the head, we ain't got to do anything. Our life, our words, our sincerity, our love for them, we got to show it to them. You got to persuade them. You got to turn. You got to calm. You got to be born again. You got to have kingdom. Then Paul, the third thing, Paul was compelled by Christ's love. 2 Corinthians 5 14. Look what he said. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. He died for us all. And those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. When you get saved, you're no longer your own, believe it or not. You don't get saved to go do your own thing. You belong to Christ. You are the property of the King of Kings and Lord of Law. And he wants you to do what his plan is for your life. Let me tell you something. God's plan for you is much greater than what you yours is. Right. Yeah. That's right. Come on. Trust me. Come on. Trust me. His plan for your life is better than anything you can dream up. Come on. So you just as well submit to him and say, God, yeah, I'm yours. Do whatever. Because I know I'm trying, I'm tired of fig trying to figure it out. It's yours. And I'm going to trust you. And I guarantee you the end result is going to be better than anything you could have even thought of. Yeah. Guarantee that. Paul's point was there's one thing that will really bring about the change in a believer's life. And to move him or her towards Christ's likeness. And that is the love of Christ. That he himself pours into our hearts. I, I don't know if you experienced that when you got saved. I knew Christ forgave me, but somehow God, by the Holy Spirit, poured out His love. Yes. Yes. Come on. A love that, that you, you, you could never know from any human being. Yes. Yes. It was a greater love. It was God's love being poured out into our hearts. You know, I, I, I've tried this many times. That's why I'm not trying it. I'm going to preach this series to you, and I'm going to let God do what he's got to do in you. I can't attempt to coerce you to share your faith. I can't do that. And I'm not going to try to shame you if you don't or, or try to move you by guilt. I ain't going to do any of that. I'm not going to make you conform to anything. Because if you conform to it, then it, it's really not anything with you. Your heart has never changed. Right. See, this thing is about a heart thing. Our hearts got to have the heart of God, the heart of Christ, if we're going to do that. When you witness to somebody, you got to have God's heart, God's love in you to want to see that person saved. The heart is that unseen world within us where true Christian ministry exists. See, it's got to come out from the deepest part of us. Paul said, for the love of Christ compels us. Yeah. Nobody's going to make me go knock on that door or go call this person or go speak to this person. It's going to be the love of Christ in us that's going to move us to do it. Yeah. And without it, you're just speaking to the wind. The Bible says we have the love of Christ shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. This causes us to love God intensely and to love and labor for the salvation of men, knowing that without them hearing, they're going to go to hell. Love for the lost is the effect produced by the love of God that's poured into us. See, when we understand how much God loves us, then we can look at somebody and say, God loves them too. God, he died not just for me, he died for them. Right. Every vile person out there, Christ died for. Right. Come on. Say, well, I don't want to talk to that person. He's, he's a done God. Well, you don't have to, but God died for him too. Right. Right. Come on. Christ so loved the world as to pour out his life for us and influence 
So we, we are influenced the very same way by God's love that Paul said we are compelled, by God's love, we are compelled to do it. That we would desire to spend and be spent for His glory. I'm going to spend my life and I'm going to be spent for Him. The salvation of souls will be by the same fear of God that the apostles endeavored to persuade men with. What do you think? What do you think made them guys go out? What made you think all the apostles, except for the apostle John, went there? They all died a martyr's death for the same gospel that I'm preaching to you. They were willing to give their life for us. See, the love of Christ compelled them to do it. Yes. He compelled them to do it. Romans chapter 5, verse 5, Paul says, and hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. That same Holy Spirit that compelled the apostles to do what they did is the same Holy Spirit that's in us. Same, not a different one. Come on. It's the very same one. And the fourth compelling force Paul had, he was compelled to preach the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9, 16. Yet when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, for I'm compelled to preach it. Woe to me if I do not preach it. I pioneered the church in River Ridge back in 1981. In 1987, God called me to pastor the Met Church. I resigned the church. That church called me. They want to interview me. I said, well, I'm resigning here because God said I'm going there. When they interviewed me, they didn't take me. So now I was without a church. I was without a job. I had to go work for my brother in a vending company. He paid me well. God bless him because I was there. I told him that. He said, I can't pay you what you need. I said, it's okay. I need to be here. And I said, for God to bless me, you have to bless your business. He says, all right. If God blesses me, I'll bless you. Guess what? Business took off. And he was blessing me. And Sister Dawn and I moved to Slidell. We built a three-story house on Lake Pontchartrain. Listen, we had everything. Brand new house. Sun deck. Boats underneath, jump in a boat, fishing in five minutes, living there. Was out on the porch one day, screen porch, looking out over my kingdom. And I was sitting here drinking a glass of iced tea. The Holy Spirit came with me. I told Sister Dawn, I can't sit here. Drinking iced tea, knowing that people are dying and going to hell, and I'm a preacher. Remember that, man? After that, it was all over. Was it long? Six months later, the same church that didn't want me the first time, it's this church. They took me the second time. I said, we're rolling now. Yes. But you see, I'm compelled to preach the gospel. Just like Paul said. Paul said, woe to me if I don't do it. See, that's what I felt. I'm sitting on that porch with the ice tea. I got to get out of here. I, 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 I got to preach the gospel. People thought I was crazy. My brother that, that, that I was working for, when, I, when that church called me and they were thinking about getting me this time, my brother said, don't do that. I'm going to give you this amount of money. I'm going to give you more money. I said, you can give me twice that money. That church called me, I'm out of here. And they did. See, what is the gospel? The gospel is the good news. We've got to tell people God loves them. God's willing to forgive them of their sin. God's willing to give them a life that they never knew existed. God's willing to pour out his blessing on you. 
I want to tell you something. We're not supposed to suppose that Paul was compelled to preach, you know, that if he didn't have a choice, you know, he didn't have a choice. Well, he really didn't have a choice. It wasn't that Paul would rather do something else. No, Paul was saying, I couldn't help it. I got to do it. See, and as a believer, our life depends on being a witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. What he was saying, I can't help it. That's the evidence of his call was irresistible. I couldn't do it. Listen, he called me to preach the first time. I was a successful businessman making a lot of money. More money I've ever made in my life. God said, you're out of here. All right. If we're truly submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ, he's going to lead us and guide us to people. Mm -hmm. We are his ambassadors. Who's going to speak for him? Us. Yeah. It's going to do it. See, it left no room for debate for Paul. It, it left no room for debate for me. Can't debate it. God said, you're going to preach this gospel. All right. The evidence is too much for him. See, when the call of God is on your life, it's strong. You can't walk away from it. My whole world changed. Never looked back. Don't want to look back. But I want to tell you something. We're all not called to be a minister. That's right. We're all not. I hope some of you are. But we're all not. But I will tell you this. We are all called to be witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. That's right. Come on, Jesus. That's what his church is. Yeah. That's what the body of Christ is. See, we need to be to the point where we would be miserable if we don't do it. If we don't have a chance, we ought to be miserable. We ask you, what is it I'm existing for? Lord, send me somebody to talk to. I believe God will make a way for anyone who is able to witness. They desire to be used. Like I tell you, I was on the way to their funeral. I said, God, just give me one of these guys. He gave me all the guys. You got to be willing to do it. If you have work, you work with a bunch of people, pray, say, God, I know there's somebody here you want. I'm the ambassador here. See, you are the ambassador wherever you are. Mm -hmm. You're representing the throne room of God. But let me tell you something. God will use these compelling forces. You, we need them. We need the Holy Ghost. We need Christ's love. We need the fear of God. We need to know what the gospel message is. Because that's what God's going to use. You see, the more of God we want in our lives, the more of his character. Say, I want more of God in my life. Well, guess what? When you have more of God in your life, you're going to be like God. You're going to have the same heart God has. You're going to have the same compassion God has. You're going to have the same love God has. You're going to be like God here on earth. And the more we have his heart, the more we will see what breaks God's heart because it's going to break ours. You see, your relatives, listen, Sister Dora and I, we got 17 grandchildren, 12 great grandchildren, another one on the way. Our, our family keeps going. We want to see them all in. Yeah. Remember, we're following someone who went to the cross of Calvary to save people. That's who we follow. Right. So I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a Christian. Well, that means you're a follower of Jesus. Where did he go? He went here. So if he went there, we got to be willing to go the whole way in our life for the Lord Jesus Christ. And what did he promise us? Matthew 28, 20. I'm going to be with you always to the end of the age. See, what we're doing, we're not doing it alone. God says he's going to be here with us. I want to tell you this. The force is with us. Yeah. Come on, Jesus. Yeah. Stand with me. Come on, Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. Let's get around the altar. Let's pray. If you have need, 
Let me and Joseph 